Let me get your attention, please, into the book of Ephesians in chapter four. We'll start by looking at a very well-known phrase in that chapter, do a little bit of context work, and then we'll zoom in on two particulars that have already been noted in the bulletin. Baptism is a doctrinal question and homosexuality as a lifestyle choice. So we'll get into that as we go. Uh, what I mentioned this morning, I just want to say again that this lesson for me came together early on Monday morning after I had spent the evening last Sunday night with a bunch of our high school students. And what I asked them to begin in Ephesians 4 is I asked them, what does it mean, verse 15, to speak, and this is just a simple slide to illustrate, to speak the truth in love. We talked about as a group that sometimes you have to say something. In fact, a lot of times it is the usage of our words by which we sway people in a way that honors God and accomplishes his will. But when we speak, there are two basic criteria. Now, in some senses, they kind of mingle together, don't they? I, I don't think you could call them incredibly distinct. I mean, if there's no love in what I say, how could that even be called truth? That kind of a thing. But I also think we understand that there is a distinction in the way that it functions. One is what we speak must be true. Jesus is the truth. What we speak must be true to the will of God. It must honor what is in the scripture. It must share the will of God. There is truth and there is error. There is of God and there is of men. We must always speak the truth. But just as important is the manner in which we speak the truth and the motive behind the truth that we speak. And that has to be love. We speak out of a sense of loving the person that we're sharing this with, even though those truths at times can be difficult and direct and even hard to receive. If they believe that we love them, then we have a chance of helping them to grow. And we do so because we want to save their souls. So I kind of asked the group, you know, what would it sound like if you were speaking the truth, but you had no love? And a couple of them came up with the kind of things that you would think where you just accuse and judge and label and express yourself angrily. And even if you're saying the right thing, if you're yelling it unmercifully, then you've maligned the very truth that you speak. They were right about that. And then I asked them about the opposite. What if, what if you love people? And again, it's not really a separatable thing, but you know what I mean. You, you love people so, so much and you just want them to know how much you care that you're not willing to speak the truth to them. And I think I asked the class like what that sounded like. And we had a couple of young men visiting last week. And one of them said, you know, it's like you're just all right, just like you are. Uh, you don't need to change anything. You don't need to do anything like just basically the full acceptance concept of the gospel, which is not the truth. We want to do both of those things. Now, in these two chapters, you can find out why that's so important. I mean, look back early in chapter four. We'll just take a few minutes on this. We studied this a few weeks ago. There's only one body and there's only one Holy Spirit and there's only one hope and one Lord. One Lord, one faith in that Lord, one baptism for that Lord, and one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There are not many gods. There are not many lords. There are not many different faiths that go whatever way that they want to go. The Holy Spirit doesn't accomplish multiple different missions that defy itself. That's not the truth. And so in a world where everybody kind of wants to build it where it works for them, there's just one of these things for each, and that truth needs to be shared. But how do we share it? Well, we studied this already. Verse 2. We always share it with humility. We always share it with gentleness. We always share it with patience. We have to show tolerance for one another in love. I think the reason is we don't all grow at the same rate. And some things are a little harder for some people to give up than others. But if we're going to preserve the unity of the spirit, we have to have the character of verse two and speak the truth of verse four through six. That's kind of the way that works. Here's another reason why you got to speak the truth in love, because we all have some growing to do. Raise your hand if you have no more growing to do. Raise your hand if you have nothing left to learn. If you've got it all figured out, you say, well, you're kind of there's that supposition. No, that's that's first verse 11. He said, I set up these teachers to equip the saints for the work of service, to build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of a statue which belongs to the full. We're all working on that. Everybody in this room in Christ is working on how do we become more mature? How do we understand the truth better and how do we share it better? So we're going to have to share truth with each other to get there, but we're going to have to do it in love. The truth is not everything is true, verse 14. There are false ideas. There are doctrines that are not of Christ. 
there is trickery that sounds really, really good, but is not right. It is presented craftily and deceitfully. That's the false teacher we studied throughout the New Testament. They are deceitful and crafty and maligning and purposefully trying to bend things to their will. We've got to share with each other that that's not right. And if you're captured by one of those false ideas, somebody needs to tell you the truth because error will cost you your soul. Somebody's got to speak to you the truth. But we do that in a way that expresses that what we want to do is we want to love each other and we're doing this because we love each other as we grow up because we all have work to do. Verse 16, we have lots to grow in. As you move through this, speaking the truth in love, verse 25 and 26 naturally means not lying. I mean, if I lie to you, it doesn't matter how much I say I love you. I have not honored God's will for our relationship. It means not being bitter and angry. Verse 26, you go, well, it's true. So it doesn't matter how mad I am or how angry. It does matter. Because we can't let anger drive the way we speak truth. In verse 31, we can't let bitterness and wrath and anger. We look at these verses a lot. They're so fundamental. And slander. Well, it was true. It doesn't mean it's not slander. The truth has to be packaged in this idea that everything that is true is coming from a person who loved you enough to give it to you. And Jesus has presented truth to you for the explicit purpose of drawing you to him. And every time we share truth, the goal ought to be to draw the other person to us. That's the idea. Now, here's where it gets in chapter five. I need to talk to you about this. In chapter five, it gets away from just the way brethren interact and it gets to the world around us. We need to share truth with the world around us. We need to do so because we love them, but sometimes things need to be said. Look at verse three, immorality, impurity, greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this, you know, with certainty, verse five, it's no question about it. No immoral or impure or covetous, idolater, man of those things has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's the truth. That's true. Immorality is not something a child of God can possess. And so what we have to do is we have to find a way to express that in a way that gives people hope. Uh, In the world, this is what I wanted to get to, we're trying to please the Lord. Well, verse 11, not only does that mean I don't act like the world, it actually means that I have to expose the darkness in the world. This is not easy for Christians to do. To go to school tomorrow or to work and see someone who is immoral, who is profane, who is ungodly, and the truth is they can't be in the kingdom of God. They need someone to tell them what is right, and yet we need to do so in a way that doesn't just condemn them in the darkness, it exposes them to the light. I love verse 14. I'm still not sure I've got verse 14 right. But verse 14 says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. I don't think he's talking to the Christian. I have have seen the light. I think he's talking to the people in the world that you might share the truth with. They are caught in darkness. You need to expose that darkness, verse 11. Some of it, verse 12, is disgraceful. Somebody needs to make it visible, but your message to them is not you're a terrible person or this is disgusting or I can't be near you right now or you don't fit in with... It's not that. It's wake up. Arise from the dead that you are caught in. And don't you know Christ will shine on you? Me? You. No matter what you've done, no matter how bad it has gotten, no matter how many wrong, like that's the idea of love, verse 14, is that the goal is for Christ to shine on us. So we want to learn to do that. So what I did with the students the other night is we just looked at two examples for that. I chose one doctrinal one and one that based on morality. And so let's talk about baptism. I'm going to put it all up here for you. If I ask you to make a Bible argument for me that immersion in water, that immersion in water is necessary to obey the gospel. Do you think you could prove that? I believe I could prove that. I didn't even put Mark 16 on this text, but Jesus said in Mark 16 and 15 to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then in the very next verse, he said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved and he who disbelieves shall be condemned. Can you show me, and I'm gonna use this word on purpose, so pick up what I'm laying down. Can you show me the argument for the necessity, did you hear my wording? Can you show me the way you argue that, you go, yeah, I'm good at the argument. I know how to win that battle. Our language is deceiving our purpose. Part of what happens in what's called enemy making 
is you have the ammunition and you present your argument and your goal is to win the argument, not win the person. And when both sides are trying to present a winning argument, it makes enemies and it doesn't leave space for any of that tension to unwind. It doesn't leave space to draw anyone closer together. They're already bowed up against each other. So here's the thing. I'm not saying that you're, I said it again, your argument's not good. Your argument is probably great. How we present that argument and the way that we interact with people matters. Let me show you this. Let's do all three of these. So you go, okay, here's, here's what I would say is true. I would also go to Acts 2. I would show someone that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, they asked Peter, what shall we do? They had just heard what they had done to the Christ. He said, Peter said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's my argument. I argue to you that the only way to have your sins forgiven is to repent of those sins and be baptized in Jesus' name. And two things happen, three things happen when you do. One is your sins are forgiven. Two, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And three, God adds you to the church. Great passage, powerful passage. But what I want to show you in this text is, even in this text... The way that this is presented to them is presented in a way that draws them to the truth instead of beating them down with it. This opens with this idea that God was raising Christ from the dead and that there were these activities that took place. In verse 36, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now they were pierced to the heart. They were pierced because Peter's sermon wasn't, here's all the ways you are wrong and here's all the things you need to do to get right. I think I've run this by you before, so I don't expect to surprise you. But how many times did Peter mention baptism in his sermon? Zero. What did Peter tell them to do in the sermon? Nothing. He spent the entire sermon, verse 22 through 36, telling them that the same Jesus they murdered still loves them. The same Jesus they put to death was raised from the dead and has ascended to the place of honor. He came because he loved you. He died because he loved you. And now he is raised and he still wants to save you. This is a message of hope for people who had murdered him. And so the message is, if that hurts your heart, he could have said, tough, you've done too much. But instead he said, look, the offer is still made for you to repent and be baptized and have your sins forgiven. He goes on, verse 39, for the promise, the promise is for you. These are the murderers. These are the godless ones. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, certainly on, along that same line, he t- solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, he didn't exhort them like, go do, he just be saved from this perverse. That's how you speak the truth in love. The truth of baptism is that none of us deserve to be cleansed, that none of us deserve to be forgiven, that all of us should be condemned for what we had done. And yet Jesus was raised for us anyway. And God is still issuing a promise to anyone, anywhere who is willing to listen to this simple fact. He wants to save you. That's love. You love that love? He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be baptized in my name and have your sins forgiven. You see what I'm saying? You present the same essential nature of baptism, but you present it in the context of, isn't it amazing how much he loves you, how patient he's been with you, and how intense his promises are for you. Now let's just obey him. We obey him because he draws us to it. Let me show you another example. Romans 6. Romans 6, we know very well, great argument for baptism. This, these three with maybe a couple of others, we could add, I think, an ironclad argument that everybody needs to be born again in water. And in Romans chapter six, we read in verse three, do you not know? And these are people who had already been baptized, but he's reminding them what happened. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death so that therefore we having been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If you've used this passage to show people, I mean, I've done this a hundred times. Jesus could not be raised until he was buried. Everybody knows that. Here's my logical argument. He could not come alive again until he died and he could not be raised. And I ask people, could he be raised before he was buried? And they say, no. Well, how do you expect to be raised unless you are buried? I think that's a pretty good logical argument, actually. You've got to die before you come back to life, don't you? They say, yes. Well, this text, I'm arguing a point to you, and I think it's the right way to get the point across. He's saying, when we are baptized, that is us dying. And that is us being buried, united with him, and that is us being raised to a new life. How are you going to be raised to a new life without being buried? So the argument there is worthy to make, but I think it's also important to note that there is a great heart of love that should be wrapped around that. I don't want to just convince you logically. I don't want you to go, Whoa, okay, wow, you know, I, didn't, I never really thought about the, can't be, well, I guess I should be baptized then. That's not how I want to convince you. I want to convince you because chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, all the law did was increase transgressions, but here and now where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. I want you to know that there is enough grace in Jesus to take away every sin you've ever committed. And you cannot have done too much and you cannot have gone too far because his grace is greater. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to know in verse 6 that your old self was crucified with him. I don't know that you did that with your power. That's what he was willing to do. He was willing to say, let's put to death all of that. Let's take away that body of sin. Let's free you from slavery and let's let you live a new verse 8 in him. That is love start to finish. Freedom from my sin, freedom from my past, freedom from... I get to be free with Christ? That is a loving I use the word inclusive, I'm careful. I mean, he wants to include you into it. You go, man, I want that. Good news, you don't actually have to die on a cross. Good news, you don't have to physically die to get there. You in water can make that connection. That's when somebody's gonna say, please baptize me. And it's not so much a logic argument as it is one based on faith. And so when we look at these, I want you to see in the text themselves, it's not truth devoid of love. There is an emotion of gratitude and thankfulness of just overwhelming joy at what is possible that should lead people to the water. It's almost like grace to faith to light, like what you know about God's grace touches your heart and you run to this water because only there can you find forgiveness. First Peter three is another example. First Peter three, I would argue to you that they're all like this. I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about Mark 16 that I mentioned earlier. You could say in verse 16, he who believes and is baptized can be saved. But if you back up one verse, he said, go and preach the gospel to the world. What does gospel mean? The good news. Go tell everybody the good news. What's the good news? Jesus is the good news. The kingdom is the good news. Salvation is the good news. In fact, the whole book of Mark, Mark opens in verse one and goes, let me tell you the gospel of Jesus. And then he just gives you 16 chapters of an awesome Lord who loves and serves and develops his power. And then at the end, it says, hey, he who believes in his baptized will be saved. Truth, that's the truth. But it doesn't stand by itself in a corner in one verse. It is a part of God's story of love for you. First Peter is the same way. Look in first Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, we know verse 21. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I could talk more about this. Baptism now saves you is a great argument. Can you be saved without baptism? Well, baptism now saves you. I know that. How many times have you just forwarded your answer? Well, baptism now saves you. Well, I don't think, well, baptism now saves you. Would you quit arguing with people and start convincing them? Show them. Show them in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 that Christ died for sins once for all, that the just died for the unjust so that he might bring us to God because he put to death in the flesh, having put death in the flesh, made us alive together in Christ. It is God, verse 20, who is patient with us, waiting on us to understand that Christ is drawing us through his death, that it was Christ, verse 21, who was raised, and it is Christ, verse 22, who is ascended. Do you see who he is? He is the one 
who gave his life to draw you to God. He is the one who was raised so that he would have the power to hold you with God, and he has ascended. And in between all that, verse 20, is tons and tons and tons of patience. He is so patient. That's the only reason I'm still here. I don't know about you. He is patient. Now, corresponding to all of that, and Noah and the ark and God waiting, baptism now saves you. The question isn't, do you hear me speaking? I'll speak more slowly. Baptism now, like, do you hear what I'm saying? The question is, do you believe that Jesus died for you and that he patiently awaits for you to be raised with him and to sit with him in glory? Because if you do, then baptism now saves you. That's the truth. And it's the truth in love. That's the idea. Let me show you the other thing. I know it's going to be a great title on YouTube tomorrow. Baptism and homosexuality. People will be like, what in the world? Well, my point is, this is a totally different thing. It's a totally different thing. And yet it's not a different thing. Both of these are emphatically taught in Scripture, I would argue, beyond any reasonable doubt. They are conclusive. Baptism is the commandment of God for people who submit to him. And homosexuality is not a part of the kingdom of the Lord. What are the verses for that? Well, let's take a look at them. There are several, but I would say if you're going to have this conversation with someone, and I'm kind of hoping this helps you have those conversations with people. And by the way, not just on these two issues, on any number of issues, but you probably recognize these three verses. So let's finish with them, these three verses. But I want you to see what I've done just to the right of them. I didn't run off to another place to go, oh, by the way, over here it says I still love you. No, like in the text itself, there is an argument that this rule for you not to live a same-sex life is a rule born of the love of God, and you're being drawn out of that to a God who cares about you. That's the message. Uh, Romans 1, just for instance, Romans chapter 1, it's talking about a lot of what, what was going on in their culture and the different things. And, and we know verses 26 and 27. In Romans 1, 26 and 27, for this reason, God gave them over to a degrading passion for their women exchange, verse 26, the natural function for that which was unnatural. In the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. I appreciate the fact that this did not just use the word homosexuality, it described it. It described, people go, well, those verses just mean sexual assault and, and unsavory. They, they described women yearning for women and men yearning for men. And they described the acts of that as indecent and unnatural. I kind of appreciate that Paul did that in Romans. He didn't just use a word. He described a thing. And so if you went here to show this is degrading and not the will of God, you would be right. But don't forget to present the love of God. I wonder that when it comes to something like homosexuality. Sometimes we might think people are so far gone or we're just trying to put our little dent in this, cult, dent in this culture. And so we're just like, that's wrong and it's degrading. Well, what's your purpose with the finger? What are you doing? You know what I want them to know? I want them to know, verse 16, that I am not ashamed of the good news of Jesus. I am not ashamed of the saving news of Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm eager to preach it, verse 15. For it, what is it? Does it judge me? Does it label me? Does it say I'm no good? No. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes it. To you, to me, to anyone, anywhere, any past, Jew or Greek. Which to you is like, what's the big deal, dude, Jew or Greek? Huge deal for them. Samaritan, Jew, Gentile. They had a lot of difficulties with that. He said, look. The gospel is here to save anyone and everyone. I also added just in my own notes, verse 20, like God's been showing himself to you forever. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that we are without excuse. God, you think that that's not judgment to me. That's that's mercy. Mercy that God is providing knowledge of himself in the world around us. In the 600,000 nerve endings of each of my eyeballs, I'm using to observe the world around me that God gave me and developed for me in intricate detail. Like God is showing himself to us in these amazing and wonderful ways so that we can learn two lessons. One, God is. And two, God is the savior of those who believe in him. Now then, he built this natural world and he loves you 
And homosexuality is not a part of his natural world. And it is outside of the way he wants you to be loved. Do you believe that? That's a whole lot different than just marginalizing someone as despicable. I don't know which one of us would be. We all are until Christ finds us. Truth. Yes. Love. Always. First Corinthians six. First Corinthians chapter six, please. First Corinthians six verses nine and ten. I think we know this list. Do you not know? Do you not know Christians? He's writing to that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he makes a list. Don't be deceived. This is the truth. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now I'm going to stop there a moment. Keep in mind, I think we missed this a little bit. This was not written so that you could pull it out, go to a non-Christian and toss it at them. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? This is written to Christians. This is written to save people. This is written to people who have gone through this already. So when you use this verse with your friends who are either sympathizing with same-sex lifestyles or supporting or investigating, don't go, well, God wrote 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 for you. He actually did not write it for them. Well, I mean, he did, you know what I mean. But he wrote it to Christians about their journey. You know the way you present it to your friends? You say, let me show you about a church of people where they were told the truth. The truth is sexual sin like fornication and adultery and being effeminate and on purpose and, and being a homosexual, that there is no room in the kingdom. You go, that's cruel and that's mean and that's judgy. Look at the next verse. You know what the love is? The love is such were some of you. Do you understand that there were previously homosexuals who were a part of the church in Corinth? But you know what? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. The love of this case is that these people had these problems. But when they found the gospel, Romans 1, and they saw the natural presence of, a, the natural will of a good and present God, their response was to be washed. I love the fact that it didn't say you washed yourself, you sanctified yourself, you justified yourself. It's very clear that they had to give up their lifestyle. They definitely had to repent and change. They had to do the right thing. But that's not what he emphasized in verse 11. He emphasized what God did for them. He washed you. He sanctified you. He justified you. You tell your friends that homosexuality is sin. The message isn't just that it is sin. It is that God cleanses sin. And God can make us true and good and whole. And he's done it before. You say, well, that's all. It never works. And he's done it before. A long, you go, know what, like a couple years ago? No, a really long time ago. Really, really long time ago he did that. Changed people. And by the way, just so you know, I mean, you see it. This isn't just a homosexuality point. This is an idolatry point, a thievery point, a covetousness point, a drunkard point, all those. The truth is always drawn and motivated by love. First Timothy chapter one, please. First Timothy one. First Timothy chapter one. Love is probably my favorite way of approaching this, and I want to end with it. First Timothy chapter one, there it is. I mean, this is one of our short list of verses that are emphatic. I don't think there's any way to look at this lifestyle and just, there is no way to justify it in Christ. And here's another verse that talks about that. He says, we know verse eight, the law is good if one uses it lawfully. He goes on to say, look, the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious for the ungodly and the sinners. The law is there to show their guilt, to correct them for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers. Not just homosexuality. It's not a sin any different than anything else on this list, but it is all against the law of God. And whatever else is contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. So here's the thing. This list needs to be taught. It's the truth. You want to know what is in accordance with sound doctrine? In this text, what is in accordance with it is you must live a righteous life and avoid sinful, unholy, profane, murderous, immoral, and evil things. What's the love in that? How do you say that lovingly? Just keep reading. 
I don't think Paul was a homosexual in his past. I don't think so. But he was a killer, wasn't he? He was a killer in his past. He goes on to say this. What's his next line? His next line isn't, you get it? You going to do it? You better hurry. That's not his next line. His next line is this. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Why are you talking about yourself, Paul? Because I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with faith and love, which are found in Christ Jesus, not out there in that garbage, in him. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You want me to name one? I'll name one. Me, he says. In fact, I'll give you the one who's in first place. I am foremost sinner of all. Yet for this reason, I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What's his argument? He's talking to a homosexual. He's going, this is not natural. This is not right. This is not good. The law says, old law and new law, that you cannot live like that. Now, I want you to listen to me say something else before you respond. That has not been a problem in my life, but I have had my own problems. Probably my problems may be even more harmful to others than your problems. I found mercy in Jesus and release from that which I thought I was going to have to live with for the rest of my life. And the fact that he would save even, are you humble enough? Is everybody in this room humble enough to say this to any person you meet tomorrow? That the number one way I can show you that God is merciful is that he forgave me. If he can forgive a guy like me, I know he can help you. You know what that is? That's the truth. You know, because mercy's truth too. And it's the truth in love. He's drawing people, isn't he? When you take just a soundbite of a verse, it looks like he's trying to cull people. When you look at the context of the letters, it looks like he's trying to draw them. I saw this quote in a book the other day. I think I've mentioned it to you. Jesus didn't make enemies. He just revealed them. He just put the light in the room, the gospel light. He just put the light in the room. This is the truth, and this is why it's true, and this is what it means. Enemies revealed themselves if they fled that light instead of were drawn to it. Last thing, 2 Timothy, and I think I have it up there at the top. It's already up there, isn't it? Yeah, 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, I just love this text. We know that we must accurately handle the word of truth. Everybody here knows 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. You must accurately handle the word of truth. But if your vision there, and we even have like sword imagery in Ephesians. But if your vision is, I need to be a great sword handler so I can go cut everybody up, then you have no clue what you're talking about. He's, that you're fighting the devil with that sword. You get that? You're fighting the father of lies to try to help people come out from under his influence. If your sword is to strike someone else, a brother or an enemy, then you don't understand why you're holding it. Yes, know how to use it. Don't be ashamed of it, verse 15. Accurately handle it. But look in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 23. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. What's wrong with quarrels? What's wrong with a good argument, a good fight, a good battle, public forum? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it is that's not what Christians do. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. But be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those. There's the truth. If you want to see another verse, you go, is there another place that says speaking the truth in love? It's right there. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Basically a synonym phrase. Speak the truth, correct those in opposition. Speak with love, gentleness. 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 They're equally valuable. Why? Why so gentle? This guy's making these mistakes and this guy's chosen this lifestyle and this guy won't be back. Why am I being so gentle? Well, we need to be firm in the sense that we need to fear the wrath of God. But again, that's God's wrath that will come down, not yours. But in the end, here's why. Because what I really want is that they may come to their senses. That's what I want. They may escape the snare of the devil. That's what we're looking for. 
having been held captive by him to do his will. They're trapped. It was their choice, but he deceptively made those choices very easy for them. You know, everybody in your life who's not a Christian is just maybe not a Christian yet. And if they knew Jesus, they would be. Can I just say that again? Everybody in your life who's not a Christian, if they knew the power and the love and the good, they would be. There's not. A, and I, let me tell you, when Jesus comes back, everybody's going to line up to be a Christian. Everybody. Your job is to show them how great he is now so that you can present his truth, the truth, and they can change their lives and he can help them. He can help them. Let's make sure we're helping them also. Do you need help? You need help? Maybe it's not one of these two things. But speaking the truth means we got to tell you exactly what the Bible says about where you are and where you need to be. But loving you says we do so with gentleness and patience, confessing our own problems, and we do it together. You want to do that together? If you do, come now. We stand and sing.